Okay, thank you very much. So this is my my abstract. And so basically, what I'm going to talk about is when we make theories about the complex behavior of systems like fluid dynamics, um, we want to, of course, find out whether the theories work. And sometimes the mathematics is so compelling and the derivation is so strong that there is no room for doubt. Um, and we are convinced that the theories will work. Um, turbulence theories typically don't fall into that category. And there's always a leap of faith. There is some bit that we can't prove. Um, that's part of why, why this network is here to kind of extend the boundaries of what's, what's going on. Um, so when that happens, we want to test our theories against uh, experiments or increasingly new simulations. And um, what I want to talk about is basically a couple of problems in, in atmosphere ocean fluid dynamics, which is my field, uh, where this debate about whether theories work has been raging for, for decades in particular cases. And often those discussions are framed in terms of um, turbulent cascades of energy from scale to scale and the power laws that you should observe if that cascade is happening. And the idea is if you have two different theories and they predict two different power laws, then you can make an experiment and measure the power law and you can decide which theory is right or wrong, much as like the advance of the perihelion of Mercury was meant to decide whether Newtonian gravity was correct or Einstein's gravity was correct. However, of course, it's a little bit complicated by several theories might actually predict similar slopes, yeah. or we might actually have difficulty establishing from the observations what the precise slope is. So there's more to this than, than, than just a simple um, kind of philosophy of science exercise. So I want to, to, to describe some of these, or illustrate some of these issues with these examples from atmosphere ocean fluid dynamics, and then show um, a, a very simple model uh, where you can do uh, a lot more numerically than, than we can normally do with these more complicated models. And so before I go on, um, I don't mind at all being interrupted. I know with Zoom conferences, the typical recommendations, oh, please wait till the end until you want to ask a question or give your comment. But if you're like me at the end of the talk, I've already forgotten what I wanted to say. So um, I don't mind at all if you want to pipe up and um, say something or correct something that I'm saying. Okay, so with that uh, said, let me go on. Um, this, I always use this slide if I give any talk about any aspect of turbulence. So apologies for those who have seen that slide once or twice before. It's just, it's so important to have a clear understanding, a physical understanding of what we mean by inertial range, because that's sort of um, all our theories, one way or the other, typically based on inertial range ideas. So here is the um, standard textbook, uh, now 25 years old, uh, from Uriel Frisch on turbulence with the Da Vinci drawings and uh, the subtitle, The Legacy of Komogorov. And what this is about is um, the simplest case of three-dimensional homogeneous isotropic turbulence, where it's well known that energy flows from the large forcing scale to the small viscous dissipation scale, and the inertial range is somewhere in between. So the, the kind of image you can have in your mind is like a, a one meter, a one meter sized experimental setup with a propeller that's also one meter in diameter, and that's spinning with one meter per second, and you put that into your fluid, and you create a turbulent flow. So the forcing scale will be one meter, and then the, eight, the energy flux from scale to scale, which will be denoted by epsilon throughout this talk, uh, then has the dimensional scaling of u cubed divided by L. And from that, you can estimate uh, using the value of viscosity, what the viscous dissipation scale will be. That's the only dimensionally uh, correct um, formula you can write down. And if you evaluate that, what you find it's 0.2 millimeters in air or 0.03 millimeters in water. So there's a safe, at least three orders of magnitude between the forcing scale and the dissipation scale. So in these kind of experiments, there is a huge inertial range um, that we can exploit. So it makes a lot of sense to consider scales where neither the forcing is relevant nor the dissipation is directly relevant. So common with lots of other people, I will not consider any forcing or dissipation terms uh, in what I'm going to describe, um, whether or not that is really a, a, a valid thing to do uh, is itself a pretty open problem. Um, okay, so going back to the beginning, Kolmogorov 1941, uh, let me just remind you of the, of, the, of the grandfather of all of these theories. So just the Euler equations, which you're all familiar with, uh, homogeneous fluid, and there's no forcing or no, no dissipation for the reasons I just mentioned. And then there is a mean energy uh, that you can define by some suitable averaging process, and that's given by the integral of some power spectral density E of k. And then there's this 
important flux epsilon from scale to scale that you think is taking place. And that should be the same across all scales. And then you postulate that there is a law that gives you this energy spectrum as a function of epsilon on K. And then the only version you can find is, is, is this expression. So the, the prediction here is that the famous K to the minus 5 thirds spectrum should be observed. This has been observed so many times that has for many people has become, oh, that is what turbulence theory is, is finding K to the minus 5 thirds in your favorite experiment. Um, but you can ask yourself, what, what does it actually, how strongly does it corroborate the underlying theory of 3D isotropic turbulence? Right? And that question is even more pertinent when you come to do the analogous question uh, for wave turbulence. So let's, let's have a look at that. Um, so that's the question of persuasion. Are you gonna change your mind if you are presented with an experimental result that shows, oh, I've observed the slope of K to the minus five thirds. So how should we change our minds? Well, we can be optimistic and say we're all rational, maybe base theorems of use here. So your, 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 your confidence, your probability that your, that your favorite turbulence theory is correct given an observed slope, well, that would be given by this formula, it would be the, the, the likelihood of the theory before the measuring of the slope times the prediction of the slope by the turbulence theory divided by uh, the likelihood of the slope at all. Um, well, the prior turbulence theory is very subjective. My experience is that if it's your turbulence theory, the prior turbulence probability is greater than 80%. If it's not your theory, it's probably less than 20%. Um, it's a very, uh, very strong opinions about this, but typically the, the slopes are well predicted by turbulence theories, so maybe 90% or more. So the real loose end here is, well, how many, how many ways are there to get the same slope, right? And that is particularly in atmosphere ocean fluid dynamics, it has been a vexing problem. So the key ingredient, ingredient is really the likelihood of observed slope across all possible or, or reasonable theories. If you want to, if you want to look at it this way. So obviously it also comes in to with what accuracy can we actually measure the slope? That's gonna be important. And ideally we want to have confidence. So as I said, in the simple experiment that you can imagine, you have three decades, three orders of magnitude uh, of inertial ranges. So ideally you would like to have several decades of inertial ranges uh, to really minimize the corrections that come from, the, from the, the boundaries where the forcing and the dissipation takes place. And that is also a very tall order, particularly for numerics. So let me give you um, let me give you then one direct numerical simulation um, example of what the kind of the, the situation is, and then the more uh, the more detailed one about the geophysical application with data. So this is a paper uh, by one of our uh, collaborators in I mean one of the participants in this network, and uh, it's uh, from 2008. It's a direct numerical simulation of surface wave turbulence. So in deep water, I believe. Um, and what I like, I mean, the, the author points out that he's actually simulating here the, what he calls uh, the primordial dynamical equations, which I think is just a nice turn of phrase, which I think what the author is trying to stress is that these are the actual equations of motion. These are the Euler equations with the free surface. It's not some intermediate model or already something like a kinetic equation or something. So it is as close to the real thing as we can make it. And the resolution is like a 1024 squared in the horizontal plane. So it's high, but not ultra high, but it should give you a few, um, it gives, should give you some notion of an inertial range. So surface wave problem, I think is the, of course, the, the, the standard wave turbulence problem where it all came from in the sixties. Uh, what are the predictions in theory? Well, the standard sakharov Kolmogorov wave turbulence prediction for the surface wave spectrum is K to the minus four. That's just the spectral slope. Um, the heuristic Phillips spectrum is minus 4.5. Now I'm not a real expert in this, but my understanding is that the Phillips spectrum, there is some physical good heuristics about it, but it is not the solution of any equation, unlike the, the K to the minus four Sakharov equation, which is a solution to the kinetic equation. I might be wrong about this, but I think the Phillips spectrum does not satisfy any particular equation, but it is, it is a, a well-known heuristic for this process. So in this paper, this was simulated um, and this was the outcome. So on these are compensated spectra. What that means is you take you the power spectrum that you observe in your simulation. So here's the wave number K and here's the variance spectrum of your surface. And you multiply it by the power law that you think is correct. 
And if that works, then the resulting line will be flat. So here you see a nice flat line, the black line, uh, but the black line is the Phillips spectrum, not the, the, the Sakharov spectrum. Sakharov spectrum is the dashed line, which pretty much doesn't quite fit in this one. And in the middle, there's an intermediate fit with power law of 4.3. And then in the second experiment, um, something has changed slightly. Now the Phillips spectrum goes up a little bit. This 4.3 spectrum seems to fit very well. And the Sakharov spectrum fits a little bit better, but it's still not a very good fit. So the best fit spectrum is now 4.3. So now you can go back to your base theorem and say, well, what, what does that tell me? Is the Sakharov theorem correct, theory correct, or, or should I do something else? And what's interesting and what I like about this paper is that what has changed between these two versions of the experiment is they change in the details of the large scale damping right, that has been applied to the system, which means that the, what you do at the large scales, which you don't want to actually consider, affected the inertial range power laws clearly. And if you think about it, well, if you actually did a real experiment in a lab, there will always be um, finite size effects from the finite size of your container. I think it's a nice illustration of how difficult it is to actually nail down uh, your expectation or what you can expect, uh, given that the sensitivity of this over, over quite a considerable uh, range. I mean, this is um, it's a little bit hard to see in this plot, but this is uh, more than a decade, obviously, more like one and a half decades of inertial range. And yet the results are pretty sensitive to the large scale damping that's applied, I think at wave numbers less than 10. So to the, I'm not sure whether you actually can see my cursor. I keep rolling around with the cursor, but it would be to the left of this line is where the damping is applied, I think. Okay, so this is um, kind of a, a situation with a, with a numerical simulation of a very standard geophysical problem and the difficulties of making a, an assessment of what actually is going on, even in this very, very controlled environment. Um, so the second one is, is really a data problem. It's the famous gauge Nastrum spectrum in the atmosphere. So let me show you what that is. So this uh, is from the 80s, uh, where commercial airliners flying across the Atlantic were instrumented to measure the horizontal velocities and also the temperatures. And as there were lots of flights, unlike today, across the Atlantic in those days, uh, they collected thousands and thousands of flight tracks, fairly straight, I mean, geodesics. They flew on great circles, but um, and they could create very nice um, spectra. And what is, what is plotted here is a spectrum for the zonal wind, which is the east-west wind, the meridional wind, which is the north-south component of the wind, and then the potential temperature, which you can look at as a, as a density perturbation. And so on the horizontal axis is again, horizontal wave number, and again on the vertical is the spectral density. These data lines have been shifted for clarity so that they have been offset um, uh, in, the, in the horizontal to be sure all three of them. But you can see they all have a kind of similar similar shape. So it's a very famous uh, experiment, which is why it's called, why it has a named spectrum. And what we basically find is that at larger scales, there's a k to the minus three slope. And at smaller scales, there's a k to the minus five thirds slope. Aha, k to the minus five thirds. Here we are, we are in business. Um, so again, oh, sorry, as I was saying, this is from the 70s, in fact. So this flight's obviously all near the tropopause where the airliners fly, so 10 to 15 kilometers altitude typically. And yes, yeah, so there's an apparent k to the minus three scaling at the large scales, which goes over to k to the minus five thirds at smaller scales. However, the transition is at something like 500 kilometers wavelengths, right? So this is not uh, this is not uh, the experiment where you put a one meter propeller into a into a bucket of water and spin it. Um, and, and this, this has been repeated and there's more recent measurements, but they all more or less show the same thing. Um, so the large scale spectrum, people are relatively happy with explanations for it, but the, the physical origin or relevance of the small scale, the K to the minus five thirds has been subject of, of debate for the last 40 years, basically. And there still isn't, been, isn't a real consensus of what that spectrum actually consists of. So there's plenty of theories. Um, so it's really a lack of persuasion you could say, oh, maybe it is really true Kolmogorov theory, but, but that's impossible. I mean, it's 500 kilometers horizontal scale. There is no three-dimensional vortex there that has 500 kilometers. I mean, it could, wouldn't even fit in the, into the atmosphere, right? So it cannot possibly be isotropic 3D turbulence, even though it has the same power law. Uh, there are various versions that maybe the stratification uh, changes it and, and allows this to happen. Um, there's maybe it's a reversed energy flow from small to large scales or from cascade, something to do with convection. Um, so there's, over the years, there have been lots of um, explanations for it. 
Um, one particular explanation is that it's maybe it's it's not turbulence at all. Maybe it is internal gravity waves. That was one of the early suggestions. Well, I'm particularly interested in this because Jörn Kallis, uh, Raf Ferrari, who's going to talk tomorrow, and myself uh, worked on this and found a way of analyzing this data a bit better to show that it is really, uh, to a large extent, compatible with the theory of linear internal waves, uh, which will then be weakly interacting. So that will be a topic where wave turbulence kind of becomes a candidate. Um, so now I'd like to talk, I mean, I know some of you know what internal gravity waves are. I'll just give you a little bit of a, of a background. So here's a picture of you see some, some wave undulating this, this cloud. Um, here's the simplest equation in which you can look at this, a rotating and stratified flow, the linear Boussinesi equations with the Coriolis force here, and a buoyancy on the right-hand side, which acts as a force in the vertical. And the buoyancy satisfies its own little equation. It is affected by vertical motion. And there are now two parameters, a frequency f for the Coriolis parameter and the frequency n that measures the strength of the stratification. And if you look at the linear spectrum of these equations, then the time-dependent solutions are inertia gravity waves, these internal waves, and they satisfy this, this very peculiar homogeneous dispersion relationship where the size of the wave numbers doesn't matter, only their ratio matters. And it's homogeneous of degree zero. And what that means is that, that uh, in, in wave number space, the location of constant frequency is a, is a cone, um, not a sphere as we would be more familiar with. So the cone of constant frequency is, is happening in, in wave number space. And another peculiar thing about these waves is that if you force in real space at a certain frequency, the, uh, the support of the emerging wave field is also on a cone. So it's not only a, on a cone in, in spectral space, it's also on a cone in real space. And if I kind of go out of the way, you can see, eh, you can probably not see. You can see Lytle's book, which on the cover, Lytle's book on waves, which on the cover has that experiment. You can see the kind of cone structure emerging as a, something in the middle that creates the waves and the waves are propagating away in a cone. So when you work with internal waves, you sometimes feel like you're doing special relativity rather than um, fluid dynamics. So the point here is why these waves are special is the point is that their frequency is relatively high, meaning it's larger than the free Coriolis frequency and bounded by the, by the buoyancy frequency, which can be minutes. And that's very fast compared with the third mode of the system which is the, the balanced or vertical mode, which has zero frequency. And that's the balanced flow. That's the same equations. But if you set all the, all the time derivatives to zero, you find that you can have a, a pressure field that balances everything. It balances the Coriolis forces in the horizontal and the buoyancy forces in the vertical. There's no vertical motion. And you can describe everything by, by what's called the geostrophic stream function. Uh, that's the typical weather image picture where the flow doesn't go from high pressure to low pressure. It goes along lines of constant pressure because of the Coriolis force. So this is the flow component that, that is typically um, dominant and the internal waves are much faster than that. Um, so the large scale dynamics in atmosphere and ocean is basically uh, understood to be mostly this mode which then evolves non-linearly because all its dynamics is non-linear and that's what's typically called geostrophic uh, turbulence. Um, and so the question is now, well, so you have these waves and you have this geostrophic turbulence, what can you do about this? And there has been some very recent work on the interactions between internal waves and this geostrophic turbulence, which I think is, is very exciting. Um, so that came out a, a year ago in a paper by Kafi about et al from a group in, in the University of Edinburgh where they basically investigated uh, not the wave wave turbulence, but the interaction of a wave spectrum with the geostrophic turbulence. Right? And what that basically meant is that they were looking at this in the kind of WKB approximation. And they found, I mean, the usual wave action equation where there is some group velocity propagating your wave action. And, but this is an equation in phase space. So it's both X and K. And there's also a refraction term to do with the mean flow that moves your waves around. That, of course, is completely standard. And what they now looked at is, is, is treating the mean flow, this capital U here, as a random field. And following the evolution for a long time, they could demonstrate that this equation is well approximated by a diffusion equation in spectral space with a particular diffusivity tensor that they could express through the covariances of the velocity field, the of the random velocity field. Uh, and what was the take-home message of this? The take-home message was, this was a diffuse disclosure for the spectral wave action dynamics caused by mean flow refraction, really. 
and the wave action then spread along constant frequency cones. These cones that I showed earlier, if you, if you put the waves of a certain frequency down, by this action they will diffuse, but the diffusion is, is singular. It only diffuses wave action along that cone of constant frequency. That's what they found. And they, because of that very restricted nature of the diffusion, they could actually solve the equations quite well. And they also checked them with direct numerical simulations. So it's really a, a tremendous piece of work. And they were able to show the horizontal, what would be the horizontal spectrum? What would be the equivalent gauge Nastrum spectrum? And da-da, they got k to the minus two. So that's k to the minus six thirds, not k to the minus five thirds. So now you have to ask yourself, is that, can we distinguish that from minus five thirds in the spectrum? Does this persuade us? Um, so this is, this is again, so I think we are much closer to the resolution of this puzzle of what the gauge Nastrum spectrum really represents at, sm at smaller scales. But this is one of the nicest um, theories that I've come across. Um, and, and, and it doesn't quite predict the right thing, but the question is, well, do we actually know whether this is, whether minus two is different from minus five thirds in this context? Um, so Oliver, I, I, I am Freddy Boucher. May I ask you a question about uh, this work sure. by uh, Jacques Van Est and others? So the, the mean flow here is, uh, is it frozen? It's random, but frozen? Um, so, okay, so this is, this is in fact the, the crucial question. It wasn't frozen, but it was in the asymptotic regime that they were looking at, which is a weak flow. Essentially, it behaved as if it was not time dependent. But we, I mean, when we saw this paper, I mean, when I say we, in fact, that motivated us very much. So, uh, inspired some of our own work, which, which just came out. So, this year in the same journal, I was when Jing Dong was a PhD student and Schaefer Smith, who is an oceanography, oceanography colleague of ours. The institute and and we re replicated their work but now allowed for more unsteady currents and then i mean then something interesting happens i mean we could only do this i mean this, this is a version that works in shallow water you sort of get similar equations but the diffusion tensor is now not singular anymore and allows actually the frequency to diffuse now as well and i'm just going to show you this work because i'm very excited about this so here are some this is some random realization of this flow field it's some kind of random stream function quite blobby these are trajectories of the random waves in real space. And these are the same trajectories, but now in the spectral space. And they all start at this ring of constant frequency. And then they meander around this alpha parameter measures how unsteady the flow is. And if the flow is steady, then basically they don't go very far from the constant frequency regime, which is the regime they had in the other paper. But if the, if the flow becomes to be, begins to be time dependent, then they can wander around. And what we basically find is that the mean frequency grows exponentially of these waves, which is very interesting because this entire theory is based on wave action conservation. So if the frequency grows, then the wave energy must also grow by wave action conservation, wave action being the ratio between wave energy and frequency. So that means that at least in this example, the balanced flow loses energy to the waves all the time because it's increasing the frequency of these waves by this uh, kind of random refraction process, uh, kind of particular form of a turbulent interaction, and that increases their frequency on average, and that increases their energy on average. So it's kind of a, a mechanism of draining energy from the from the mean flow and energizing the waves. So but then, do you, but then do you have a, a, a feedback of the waves on the mean flow? Absolutely. I mean, this is not included in the theory um, because the in the theory the the mean flow is simply given. Um, and there, this, 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 would, this would point that there should be a feedback. It's sort of typical for these kind of um, constructions in what you like wave mean interaction theory, that it's, it's, it's consistent asymptotically to compute the changes in the wave field, including the changes in its energy, whilst neglecting the changes in the, in the, in the mean flow, um, typically. Here, um, it would be very nice to actually find out what the feedback is. And because the mean flow has been assumed to be quite weak, uh, the usual argument, oh, that the mean flow is much stronger is, is, is not really valid here. Um, so there are some theories that incorporate the, the feedback on the mean flow of these wave dynamics, um, but they're, they haven't been used in, in, this, in this context yet. Um, there is some work that has been done in that direction. That's a very good question. Of course, ideally, if I say we test our theories, one thing we don't want to test because we believe it's true is that energy is conserved overall. Um, so you're absolutely right. If the energy is transferred, then that should leave a mark on the on the mean flow, that 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 should be computable, at least afterwards. Okay. So these are the the, the two um, 
the two geophysical applications as, as um, as I said, I mean, the surface waves is not really my field. Internal waves in the atmosphere and the ocean is very much what I have been interested in for a number of years. So I'm, very, I'm, I'm quite excited about these recent theoretical developments um, that, that allow us to, to have some kind of turbulent dynamics, not necessarily wave-wave only, but wave together with the kind of third mode in these equations, uh, the kind of zero frequency mode. Um, that that is also very important and and it's here it's I mean the flow is not yeah anyhow it's, it's I think it's an exciting exciting field and internal waves are have all kinds of properties that a lot of people know about make them very special um, so I think it's uh, a lot that can be done in that direction so but again the uh, if I'm talking about what can we do we believe that these theories are, are correct again there's a kind of paucity about what we can model and what we can design mathematically and what we can actually test. As I said, this nice theory from the group in Edinburgh, well, what's the prediction? It predicts the power law slow of minus two and probably what's observed is minus five thirds, but for no particular reason. So what can we actually trust, right? So that led me um, when I got into this to think about, well, really, I would like to know for sure how you can actually test these theories. So I thought I will um, investigate a very simple model, an old model, and so some of you have seen some of these slides before, but uh, the model is the, the MMT model for 1997, which is uh, Maida, McLaughlin, and, and Tabak, um, which is a, a, a Schrodinger-like equation for a complex valued wave field psi. So we just had a talk where the nonlinear Schrodinger equation featured prominently. Here it's a one-dimensional equation. Uh, so it's just one space dimension. Uh, and it includes the Schrodinger equation as, as a special case for some of the promise, but this is basically it. You have a psi field, you have a linear evolution by this operator, and you have a cubic nonlinearity. Now, both the linear term and the nonlinear term have been decorated by these operators. Uh, the operators are very straightforward in, in, in Fourier space. So this operator, the absolute value alpha's derivative is just the multiplication of magnitude of k times a uh, raised to the power alpha of any Fourier mode. So when you look at this, then you see the role is uh, three parameters in this model, alpha, beta, and lambda. And the linear waves are all governed by this first term, first term. And then alpha just gives you the power in the dispersion relation. So alpha just, uh, that's the role of alpha. Uh, beta controls this, the scale dependent strength of the nonlinearity. In the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, beta would be zero. There would just be a cubic term. With beta non-zero, you can make the nonlinear term stronger or weaker uh, as, the, as you go to la larger or smaller scales. So that gives you an extra parameter to play with. And then finally, lambda is either plus or minus one, and it controls whether you have defocusing or focusing uh, versions of this equation. All of what I'm talking about here is the defocusing case. And the equation was designed to study exactly this. Are the other predictions of, of, of Sakharov style wave turbulence theory, can they be reproduced in a model that in, in those days already could now be simulated uh, quite well? So what happens when, when they did this? Um, okay, sorry, this, just a couple of slides to, to show you more. Uh, so as I already said, the linear wave are just described by that power law. Um, there's interactions in, in, in quartets because of the cubic nonlinearity, and they are resonant if the frequencies match. And that can happen if alpha is less than one. So the only interesting range of alpha is if alpha is less than one. Okay. Um, there are conserved quantities, there's a, an action which is conserved, this is just the, the L2 norm, and there's a Hamiltonian which has a linear part, I mean a quadratic part to do with the linear dynamics, and then the typical uh, quartic part to do with the nonlinearity. Uh, the action and the linear part of the energy have straightforward Fourier representations, the nonlinear part obviously it does not. Um, so the basic assumption is that the nonlinear energy is a small correction to the linear energy so that you can be sort of in a weak wave turbulence regime. Um, the system has two cascades, just as in 2D turbulence. And basically, you can see that the energy should flow downscale by the standard argument. And this will only look at the downscale cascade in, this, in, this, in these simulations. Um, there is a kinetic equation for the average wave action density, which in spectral space, which is this object, and it's of the standard form. So it, it has the quartic interactions and it has the resonance condition. And then it has kind of typical behavior, um, typical structure of the Sakharov equation for uh, cubic interactions. Um, what I want to point out is that, that this kind of flux term in, in space, uh, in spectral space, it has sort of three powers of n 
which means it's the sixth power of amplitude because the amplitude of the field itself is squared to give you n. So the energy flux is really in this in this equation is of sixth order in, in the amplitude of the wave field. And the corresponding time that you can then estimate over which there will be significant energy flux is a to the minus four. So it's a, it's a very long time. Um, if you just stare at the MMT equation and say, what will be the energy flux? You will get a different scaling. You'll get that the energy flux should be proportional to n squared, therefore to the amplitude fourth, and then the time would be much shorter. So of course, uh, the fact that the flux is much weaker than possible and that the time needed much, much longer than, 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 than the shortest time imaginable are of course the hallmarks of weak wave turbulence and everything is, is, is slowed down enormously to wait for the resonant interactions. Okay, so in the steady state, this is all standard theory for, for the Sakharov theory. You have two trivial steady states of equipartition of ancient energy, and then you have the famous um, power laws. So you have epsilon to the one third, uh, rather than the two thirds in, in the Kolmogorov theory, and then K to the Z, where there is a, a specific prediction what Z actually is, and that exponent is minus one minus two beta over three. So of the, of the two parameters, alpha and beta, only beta enters in the prediction for the slope, but it's a specific prediction. Um, yeah, and uh, there's a very nice paper by Balk in 2000 uh, that gives a, a very simplified derivation on how you get from the equation to the slope that doesn't use the original technique of Sakharov, which is, uh, makes it accessible to amateurs like myself. Um, so that's it. So that was, of course, all known. So the question was then, does it, did it work? So if you simulate this, uh, they found indeed a robust energy cascade uh, and a clear power law, but it was never given by the Sakharov. So this is a typical result from the 1997 paper, uh, which shows that there's a spectrum and a slope. The slope was minus three quarters, but for these parameter choices, the, the Sakharov slope should have been minus one third. So very, very different. So it wasn't observed. And in fact, it wasn't observed in none of the cases that these authors studied in 1997. So they, they tried four different uh, ways and it was never altered. So the conclusion then was that maybe the kinetic equation wasn't the correct closure and they gave a heuristic argument for a different power law, um, which has a different power here, rather than epsilon to the third is epsilon to the half. And then this coefficient M was a different formula that now included alpha. I don't want to get into how this is derived, but that was their suggestion that this formula actually fits quite well. So that obviously created a little bit of stir in those days um, and people simulated this subsequently a lot um, and, and basically came up with rationalizations why the Sakharov slopes weren't observed. And I'm not sure I want to go through all of these, but maybe the amplitudes were too high. Um, there were restrictions on beta that might not have been satisfied. Um, there was maybe intermittency that, that meant maybe a one dimensional models just don't work, or maybe it works better for freely decaying turbulence. All of those you can kind of have counter arguments. Um, it wasn't very high amplitude simulations, which is fractions of a percent in nonlinear energy. They had a case where the kinetic energy, kinetic equation that did allow downscale, upscale action flux, but it also didn't work, and so on and so forth. So basically, it's a little bit, um, a little bit open. And yeah, well, okay, I will come to that back to this, what actually the state of this system is at the very end, if I don't forget. So why was why was it so much simpler to do the Kolmogorov theory? So if you remember, this was the Kolmogorov theory for, for three-dimensional turbulence. Um, there was no kinetic equation that predicts the slope, but there's also no ambiguity from dimensional analysis or any method you like uh, to come to this result, right? And so the question is then, can we also d derive um, slopes like this for the kinetic equation just using dimensional analysis. And in fact, it was demonstrated by a paper in 2003 that basically in all cases um, known to dog and man, this is actually possible provided there's only one dimensional parameter and you can rederive all the power law slopes from Sakharov theory just using um, dimensional analysis. Um, but the MMT equation doesn't have any dimensional parameters, so you can't use dimensional analysis. But of course, you can work directly with the symmetries of the equation, so it's sort of non-dimensional dimensional analysis. So how does this work? Well, you can do this for the Euler equations as well. You can look at the Euler equations, and you can consider the ABC scaling group. So you make the velocity larger by a factor A, space bigger by a factor B, and time bigger by a factor C. And if all those numbers are positive, you stick them into the equation, you will find that the equation's invariant if A is equal to B over C. 
and it allows you to can pick B and C arbitrarily, and then you pick A as a ratio, and that gives you a two-parameter symmetry group for this equation. Of course, I mean, this is this has been known since the primordial time. I'm not telling you anything new. I just want to use this. Um, hence, if U of X of T is a solution, then so is B over C times U of X over B and T over C. And if you now say that you think there should be an inertial range, so you think there should be a relationship like this, then if you do the scalings and K gets replaced by K over B, epsilon gets replaced by this, and the energy density gets replaced by this, then you get this equation down here, which has to be satisfied for all values of A and B. And that guarantees that the only solution to that functional equation is the power law. And in fact, the power law can only have one form, it can only have the Komogoro form. I mean, there's nothing new here. It's just um, doing, rather than using physical dimensions, just use the symmetry group of the equations directly to derive a Komogoro's law. And that's the, it's the only answer. There is nothing else that can happen. There's no other inertial range law is compatible with the symmetries of the equation. So if you had a different inertial range, it would have to be from, made composed of solutions that do not actually satisfy uh, the symmetry I mean, they're, they're, they're not, they're not, they're not, that would not be self-similar. Fine, so now we can do the same thing for the MMT equation. So we consider the same ABC scaling group and we stick it in. And now we find there are actually two constraints. So C has to be equal to B to the alpha and A squared has to be equal to B to the beta minus alpha. So now it's only a one parameter symmetry group. So the symmetry group is a lot smaller than the, in, in the Euler case, because once I've picked B, I get both A and C computed from there. So I get less. So when I follow the same steps through, I want to look at an action density as a function only of K and epsilon. Um, then when you do this, you do not get a unique answer anymore. What you get is, is that the slopes P and R are related by a linear relationship where there is uh, ambiguity. So any combination of R and P that satisfies this equation would be a possible power law of self-similar solutions to this equation. So maybe, uh, so it says a whole one parameter family of possible laws. So maybe that's the reason why so many different spectra have been found in the various numerical simulations of this equation. So, um, right, so to be slightly selective for what I want to show you, maybe I'll skip a little bit, but basically we there now, there's the Komogorov expectation, which is like uh, this power law should be a third and then you get this there's the MMT heuristic closure where this is a half and then the power law is this. And this is the dimension analysis result where R and P are both variable, but they have to satisfy this joint equation. If R should be is taken as a third, then the, the dimension analysis reduces to the Sakharov spectrum. So then it, it, these become the same theory. And if R is equal, chosen to be a half, then the dimension analysis is compatible with MMT, but only in the case alpha equals a half which is the only case they studied in their paper. So um, the MMT spectrum is actually not compatible with the symmetries of the equation uh, if alpha is not equal to a half. So, so for general alpha less than one, it's not actually guaranteed to, to be realizable in that way. So, I mean, in 1997, they did this with the Cray supercomputer with a grid of 4,000 points. And today this is where I'm sitting. There's this little rubbish tin uh, seven-year-old computer, but it's, it's a lot more powerful than what they had in those days. So we can do these simulations almost on our smartwatches. Um, and so one could do a lot of those and we'll have various decades of, of integration. So I'm just gonna show you um, some results and then come to the, to the conclusions. Uh, so this is a typical run that you can do. This is the real part of the field. Well, that's what it looks like, it looks turbulent. This is a zoom of what it looks like. Uh, here are power law slopes. This is the fitted slope for this particular experiment. And there's compensations with the green one is the compensation with the Sakharov slope. And the blue one, I think is the compensation with the MMT slope. And the energy level is only 1.6% nonlinear energy compared to linear energy. So it would be a very weak regime. This is a zoom of this action density in the wave numbers. And see, I mean, it's like three decades of wave numbers here in the inertial range. Right? There's the action flux is essentially zero at large wave numbers and the energy flux is essentially constant. And basically uh, the fit to the slope is, is minus one. The prediction from MMT is minus 1.125. And the prediction from Komogorov and Sakharov is minus 0.83. So basically neither slope fits particularly well in this experiment. Um, there's a constant mean energy flux after lots of averaging. 
and um, I've said that before, but it's the, the energy flux. So this is the same picture. Um, there's something very peculiar about it that the expected energy flux is, of course, independent of wave number in the stationary regime. It has to be. But the temporal fluctuations of the energy flux at the given wave number are huge. Um, so if you measure them in your experiment, you'll, it's like this is a histogram of the flux at this particular wave number, wave number 500. And you see the energy flux is something like 10 to the minus 5. But the, the size of this histogram is 10 to the minus 3. So the, 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 the fluctuations around the mean value is like a factor of 100 or more. So really huge fluctuations in the system, which I think is, is, uh, is, is very uh, meaningful. OK, so if you look at these, these power law slop, slopes, one thing you can do is, well, you don't know what r is. But if beta is equal to 3 alpha, a special case, then the value of r doesn't matter. So. Um, in that case, you get a distinct prediction that the slope only depends on alpha compared to the Sakharov slope, which only depends on beta. But here they're linked by beta is equal to three alpha. So that either works or it doesn't work. So this is really a yes or no answer. So you can do this experiment and try it. And well, this is kind of the outcome you get. The compensated spectrum is this does seem to have a, have some has some validity. If you kind of look at this, and this is the slope which you fit, so it's 2.1 rather than uh, the slope that's too predicted here. So that's basically the case that has to work for this dynamic similarity to make sense. Um, well, you can do all kinds of games now to try to make various predictions disagree. Um, so here, uh, the value of alpha is not 0.5 anymore. So you, the MMT uh, slope isn't guaranteed to work. So you get this kind of um, result here, the yellow one, I think, no, the blue one, is 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 the uh, is the prediction from the from the scaling theory and the MMT slope is not clearly wrong. Um, so the MMT, I mean the, the, the MMT heuristic scaling really doesn't work in, in general. I mean that's just verifying that numerically that it only works at alpha is equal to a half, uh, but otherwise it doesn't work. So we can kind of don't have to worry too much about that heuristic closure anymore. Um, there's a great sensitivity of all these results to, to amplitudes and dissipation. So here's a case where um, you run the same simulation sort of at a low amplitude and a high amplitude, and you seem to get different um, slopes. I don't want to belabor the details because of time, but I mean, here you get a slope of almost minus one, which is like the Sakharov slope. And here you get a slope of almost minus 1.25, which is the uh, a different slope in this case, the MMT slope. It's alpha is equal to a half, so it can be right. And, and that's what your result would be. But if you do the, exactly the same experiment and change the dissipation, make the dissipation lower, then you get a larger inertial range. And then the slopes all change. I mean, this changes from almost 1 to 0.87, which corresponds to an R parameter that's actually less than a third. Um, and this one goes down now to minus 1, um, which corresponds to, again, the kind of predicted R parameter here is now just dropping. And this is just by changing the dissipation in a fairly large, fairly large simulation. So it's a fairly strong sensitivity of this problem um, to to the details of your dissipation. In this case, the small scale dissipation. I mean, the surface wave work I, I, I mentioned earlier, there was a sensitivity to large scale dissipation. I don't know whether there's also sensitivity to large scale dissipation here, but it's certainly sensitive to the small scale one. There's also, if one looks more carefully, there is a, a kind of noticeable change in slope as you go down in wave number to go higher up. And these slopes have been fitted always in the same location, just between 20 and 100 wave numbers. But if you sort of look at this more carefully, there seems to be more than one slope as you go down um, the cascade. So, oops. Um, okay, this is one more expand. Let me, I guess I'm just going to skip this. Um, this is just an example that shows where, again, the Sakharov spectrum isn't realized in the simulation uh, at an 8% energy level. And if you say, oh, maybe you need to lower the energy level, well, here's the same simulation with a 2% energy level. And again, um, the Sakharov spectrum isn't, isn't realized in that situation. So it doesn't change. It doesn't seem to be sensitive to lowering the amplitude. So, um, so the Sakharov rim does not have to have a wide basin of attraction in this model. So let me just summarize um, a little bit and make my main point there. Um, so if you assume this kind of power law scalings, uh, then in this model, you get this relationship. You can match this parameter R to the unobserved slope P, because we can do enough math to invert this formula. 
Um, so any slope p, you, you, you notice you get an r that, that should go with it. Um, the a priori range of r is somewhere, it should be between zero and a half. And for the Sakharov theory, it should have the value equal to a third. And the numerical simulations seem to exhibit a wide range of effective r values. And the, the Sakharov value r with one third doesn't seem to be dominant in these, in these simulations. Um, and here's the point, if I talk to people who have been doing wave turbulence for some time, they cut the dismissive of this model in the sense that, oh, everything has been understood about this model already. It's so old, we know why this, why this works or doesn't work. Well, to me, understanding means that you're able to do an a priori prediction, meaning if I tell you what alpha and beta is and how I force the model, you should be able to predict the slope um, and not rationalize what the slope is after you've done the experiment. And so far, no one, me included, can actually predict these slopes. So I don't think um, a truly predictive theory for the slopes is there. So we can always rationalize what happens in any given experiment, but we can't actually predict the slope. So to my mind, at least, uh, we don't really understand it yet because understanding means predictive power and we lack in predictive power. We have rationalization power, but that's not the same. Uh, the simple take home message for, for practice is that it's, it's a good idea um, for numerical testing of, of these kind of theories to test both of these exponents. I mean, we, we plot the power spectrum so we kind of get the exponent p, but there's a prediction also on how the density should change if you change the amplitude of the entire flow, which is exponent r. And some numerics, of course, some people have already done this uh, routinely, but that's a, a good way of not just trying to fit one number, this power law slope, but also check what actually is your, how, how true is it that the, the kind of, how much energy flux do you get per amplitude? Um, what's the scaling of that? And that's kind of an, an additional piece of information. And uh, this is Sherlock Holmes principle in the overlap of two approximate solutions, there should lie the truth um, that might be better than trying to fix just a, a single number. Okay, so um, with that, I think my time is up and my slides are also up. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice lecture. Uh, I think there were a lot of comments in the chat during the talk, so probably there are also questions. Uh, are oh, there I, people? I can look at no, no, of course, but uh, I think uh, that, that it was not really uh, like questions, else I would have uh, asked them, but uh, maybe now uh, people would like to ask some questions. If so, please um, just switch on your, your microphone. Yes, uh, thank you for the talk, it was very clear. So I was wondering if even there was a theoretical argument explaining why uh, there are uh, why there is a, stat a statistically stationary range with, with a finite variance, because I think it's not obvious at all for the, for the MMT. So can you say that again? What is not obvious? It's not obvious that the variance is uh, finite. If, if you are constantly forcing the system, it's even surprising that the variance doesn't blow up, or uh, is it obvious? Am I clear? I'm not, sure it's, I'm not sure it's obvious, but I mean, the power law slopes, um, it depends on whether they're decaying fast enough, I guess what you're saying, whether if that slope were extended forever, if the inertial range would go on forever, can I integrate it and get a finite answer for the variance? Is that what you're saying? I mean, uh, if you take the uh, heat equation with forcing, the yeah. variance uh, is, uh, will be infinite. Whereas in that system, the MMT, the variance oh. remains finite. So there is a cascade, so it's very rich. Correct, correct. Finite, so, so it's not really obvious, I guess. Yes, so I think it shares, it shares that property with the, with the hydrodynamic turbulence, right? That it's not like the heat equation, that it, it dissipates by becoming larger and larger. It dissipates by becoming proficient at moving the energy down scale. And certainly something similar, um, the same thing happens here. There's a very vigorous cascade. There's no doubt about it. Yes. Um, I haven't, I mean, it's, it's a good question about whether if the, inf if the inertial range goes longer and longer, um, is it, does it have a finite amount of, of variance in there or an infinite amount? I mean, people have, uh, have been very sophisticated about these questions about the capacity of the inertial range and what that means for their expectations of how quickly it fills up and so on. Indeed, thank you. Yeah. Yes, and I noticed in the chat is there's this, someone mentions the, the article by Miguel Honorato on the MMT model and amplitude dependence. And indeed, uh, I had a slide on that, um, which I uh, 
uh, didn't show because of interest of time, but I mean, yes, exactly. That's kind of these, in fact, these amplitude sensitivity studies were sort of all motivated by his very nice paper on trying to figure out whether the differences in slopes can be uh, explained by difference in amplitude. And basically my finding is, or our finding is here that the amplitude certainly seems to have some effect, uh, but doesn't seem to be straightforward. And the dissipation strengths has also a very huge effect. Um, so exact lengths of your, of your inertial range it seems to be dependent at very long range in spectral space. Uh, these slopes are very sensitive to the endpoints. So that's basically yeah, that's, that's what I'd like to say on that. I have also a question. So mm -hmm. uh, this 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 proves that more or less that the kinetic equation is not the right one for this uh, MMT model. So would you have an interpretation or a, a guess or, or of the reason why it, it, it doesn't work in this in this uh, specific model? Yeah, I mean, I have a, I'm not sure whether it's probably, oops, sorry, somehow I flipped out of the presentation. Um, my feeling about this is, oops, I can't get to the point I wanted to get. Let me try and see whether I can find the picture. Yeah, what I find most interesting here is is, I mean, first of all, there seems to be generally the system can have a, a wider variety of slopes than the three dimensional turbulence. It can kind of, it can be, can be doing more than one thing. And the kinetic equation for quartic interactions picks one particular member of that family. What I think might be the case is that as you go down the inertial range, um, the actual local level of nonlinearity and what's going on, I don't think is necessarily constant. So I think this kind of what's what's slightly visible in these simulations that at different parts of the inertial range actually the spectrum spectral slope changes um i think that might be very well be part of the solution to the puzzle i mean other people have have noticed that also before in the past but i think uh, it's the combination of that that maybe it's not quite as self-similar that the entire inertial range is just one set of dynamics it might be that this uh, it's kind of peculiar i mean the nonlinear energy doesn't have a direct the nonlinear energy doesn't have a simple representation in spectral space, obviously, because it's a convolution of, of spectral space with itself. And so the idea that you actually have a self-similar cascade where linear energy is gets advected by the nonlinear terms throughout Fourier space, even though there isn't actually anything in Fourier space that really earmarks the nonlinear energy, is sort of a really complex, um, complicated scenario. And my, just, my yeah. best feeling is that that actually that there might be parts of the inertial range where the four-wave interaction is exactly what's happening and the Sakharov theory probably applies in that section of the inertia range. And then in other parts, uh, maybe it becomes something where, where rather than being local in wave number space, maybe the whole cascade is caused by some large modes uh, that are moving this along and kind of in like an induced diffusion process. Um, so that's what I've been uh, trying to look at, but this is this is just my, my feeling that the, the system um, isn't I mean, it doesn't seem to be following the four wave dynamics um, religiously throughout its spectral range. It seems to me that, that different parts, there is a single cascade, there's a single constant energy flux that's going down the pipe, but how that energy flux is, is realized seems to depend on where exactly you are in the spectral space. So that probably means there's a long range dependency on the forcing scale that, that's yeah, not captured. This means that actually uh, uh, the way, uh, as essentially this, this system satisfies the same assumption as say many other systems for which you, you, you derive uh, kinetic equations. And, and there is no obvious reason why uh, this, this, the theory uh, could be uh, valid in other equations and it should uh, fail here. So maybe uh, the conclusion is that uh, maybe it fails for uh, all models. Yeah, I think there's. I mean, this is a, a brave, a brave opinion that you're that you're that you're doing. Um, yes, it's. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. It's certainly not an easy, not an easy uh, question to answer. There isn't. I mean, there are obviously other systems. There are good arguments saying, oh, maybe it should be two dimensional, or maybe you need more interactions. There is something that's simply special about the system. But it's hard to put your, uh, as you said, it's hard to put the finger in the point of the analysis of deriving the kinetic equation saying, oh yeah, and this one doesn't work because of something that's peculiar to the system. It does seem to set, it does seem to pass the usual uh, kind of criteria for this. 
So I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, yeah, it's a challenge. Okay, maybe the last question in the in the chat. So can can the strong dependence on the dissipation be due to the fact that the resonant interactions are not particularly local in Fourier space? That's a great question. I mean, again, it's sort of. I think that's part of the answer. Must be like this. It's sort of the same as what I said. That as you go through spectral space, um, you're not really local. The cascade is not really happening locally by some band of by some octave of wave numbers. It does seem to depend on either the forcing still being there or there being the dissipation. So it kind of does seem to touch the sides. There is a really peculiar dependence on dissipation here, which is, makes this frustrating. Which is why I still haven't published this, even though I've been kind of tinkering with this for six months is that if you go longer and longer and change the dissipation, make even longer inertia range, it seems to just never stop to depend on the dissipation. So it's extremely hard to actually get results uh, that you say, I'm confident now with 99% confidence that this is the slope I would have if my inertial range was 10 decades long. It seems to simply, it seems to still depend on this. So I think you might well be right that there is an essential part of the dynamics that touches the dissipation range, no matter how far away it is. Right. And of course, in all the derivations that we do of the kinetic equation, dissipation ranges are never, as my, my, okay, my limited knowledge of these derivations, dissipation ranges are not part of the derivation. They're put in sort of afterwards, if you, or you use this now and attach a dissipation at the end and the forcing at the beginning, but they're not really part of the, of the, of the proper derivation. So maybe that's why we lacking slightly a feeling for what can, what's going on here. Can I ask a question? Uh, this is Miguel. Hello. Yeah, hi, Miguel. Hello. Um, my question is the following. Yes, when you change the dissipation, you, you show that uh, many things happens. But the question is, if you change the dissipation, did you check if you if the ratio between the Hamiltonians remain the same or changes? Because if it changes, of course, then you, you can get different slopes because you are entering in a different regime. Uh, yeah, I can't remember what exactly we did. I mean, literally, what, what happens here is we simply, from these simulations, we simply reduce the dissipation, keeping everything the same. And if you believe um, that, the, that the, the spectral shape is all fixed by, by putting the forcing in and letting it go, right, then you would imagine that the relevant amplitudes shouldn't, shouldn't change. It's also a question whether, I mean, it's not exactly clear to me whether the simple ratio of the linear to the nonlinear energy is really all there is to it because the, um, of course, you can add a constant frequency to the to the linear dynamics. It wouldn't have any dynamical influence, but that would make the linear energy much higher. Uh, Correct. I mean, it's, some... it's just the first number, the first indication of the nonlinearity of the system. But oh no, I, I absolutely agree. agree. So if, I think it's if, part of part of that would be great if we had a better understanding of what's actually locally the relevant notion of an, of, an, of an energy and energy balance between linear and nonlinear dynamics. So we tried a little bit of trying to find a Fourier representation of the nonlinear energy. And there's more than one way of doing it, but you can define some. I spare you all the plots of those and it hasn't really been successful. But um, if we could find a measure that's kind of local in Fourier space for the nonlinear energy, right? the, the, Q, the quartic energy, um, that would allow us to, to quantify that question rather than having this, this, this this overall L2 um, kind of measure, right, which is which might not be actually the most relevant, and might also, if you make the inertial range longer and longer, it might just change, right? There's our change yeah, in the underlying. That, that was my experience, but it was hard to keep the same ratio. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right there. Yeah. Okay, so now I think we have to stop here and thank all the um, the the lecturer of this this afternoon.